Hi there, friend. This is Lee Posky. Today, I want to help someone better understand the warnings about damnation in the book of Hebrews. But first, let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, please give us discernment regarding your word. Let the hearer understand with clarity what you have to say in your word. I pray this for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now then, before we get to the warnings in the book of Hebrews, we must first understand Jesus' accomplishment in his substitutionary atonement. This is vital. The fact is, his sacrifice was accepted by the Father, as proven by his resurrection from death, which means that for everyone who trusts in the Son of God as Savior, no charge of sin can ever be laid to their account. Did you know that in all of Scripture, not even one time, has a Christian ever lost their salvation? That's vital to understand. And like I've said before, Jesus' atonement, it's as finished as last Tuesday's weather. And you can't do anything to change last Tuesday's weather, can you? Did you know that if a single Christian ever goes to hell, it'll mean that Jesus failed at his mission? And of course, we know that's an impossibility. Jesus said in John chapter 6, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. A little later, he says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Similarly, in John chapter 5, Jesus said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's ironclad eternal security, friend. So understand this. When we see warnings of apostasy in Scripture, warnings of falling away, these are serious warnings. But they're warnings in regard to false Christians, or put another way, these are tests of false Christians who mingle among real Christians. The genuine Christian need never fear God's judgment and should have confidence in his or her salvation right now. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. He's made us his righteousness as a free gift, which is perfection in Christ. We rest in his finished work. So I would tell anyone who's considering this matter, examine what you're trusting in. Are you resting in the finished work of Christ? Or are you trusting in your morality? Now then, in regard to the book of Hebrews, like any section of Scripture, we must understand context. Context is everything. The book of Hebrews was written to first century Hebrews, many of whom were still clinging to their familiar ways of the Jews' religion, and many of which weren't fully on board with the new covenant in Christ, righteousness by grace through faith. And this particular letter is telling them that their old way of doing religion is now obsolete and they'd better get on board with the new, because there is no other way to God. Believe on the Lord in earnest, or perish like their forefathers did before them, for they're not believing God. In fact, did you know that in the first ten chapters of the book of Hebrews, the only sin that's specified is the sin of unbelief? These warnings are about Christ's rejection in light of the revelation of Christ, which of course applies to anyone of any generation. And just like the first century Hebrews, the warning is to not harden your heart to the gospel of Christ. Believe on the Son of God while you still have the light to believe. So, with that context established, I'm going to now read you some passages from Hebrews, and it should make perfect sense to you now the context behind these words. From Hebrews chapter 3, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. From Hebrews 4, 
Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, and that's in reference to Joshua, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And here we are at Hebrews chapter 6. Remember context. Remember the degree of revelation these people had, and many of which then decided to still reject the way of Christ. Okay, listen to this now. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Do you see the contrast that he's making there? The, the, the false professors, the ones that are on the fence, the ones who aren't really on board with the new covenant in Christ, versus the ones who have come to rest in the finished work of Christ. It's very clear. He's contrasting two different uh, uh, peoples here. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 26, it says this, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Let me pause there. What he's talking about is, um, that if you reject this way of Christ, there is no more sacrifice for sins. There is no more way to, way to God. There is no way to have your sins cleansed um, if you reject this way of Christ and go back to your old way of Judaism or paganism or however you approach God other than through Christ. That's what he's saying. If you reject Christ, there is no more sacrifice for your sins. Okay, I'm going to continue reading. But a fearful, excuse me, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and an holy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Let me pause there. You see what he's saying here? He's talking about the wrath of God is really going to come on you in a most extreme way when you have this knowledge of the Son of God and you choose to trample him underfoot by counting it as, as uh, uh, not good enough to cleanse you, as not being enough, as rejecting it. Okay, let, let me continue reading. For we, know, for we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A little further down in the same chapter, chapter 10, he says this, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You see that? That's contrasting the false professors who fall away and apostatize versus those who rest in the finished work of Christ and are settled in that his sacrifice was sufficient. Okay, and it ends with this, verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Did you see how that, that tied the whole matter up with a nice bow on it? It, it made everything crystal clear. I'm going to read that last verse again. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. That's those who apostatize, those who fall away, those who say, Jesus ain't enough. I'm sticking with this other way that I've been doing. And he says here, But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You see, saving is by, is by belief. And that's an encouragement to the Christian that we are not like those who fall away because we do in fact believe. We've been given the faith of Christ. We rest in the finished work of Christ. So, 
Hopefully now you can see, friend, that these warnings are serious. They should be there, and they, they should be taken gravely serious by anybody who questions Christ. It, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And anybody who rejects Christ and says that it ain't enough, or they add their works to his finished work for their justification, you know that they have trampled underfoot the Son of God. And that's the greatest degree you can insult God to say that Jesus, what he did, is not enough. Okay? So, I, I hope that this has ministered help to somebody who needs to understand these, uh, these scriptures. And those who need not be afraid can now walk in the light of Christ in the knowledge of, of righteousness by grace through faith. And uh, I guess I'll end it here. Thank you for listening to me and all glory to the risen Lord Jesus Christ and no glory to us whatsoever. Bye-bye.